Uh, Stan Mole, I'm an ex-colleague of uh, Malcolm's. Uh, it's a very simple question, Malcolm. You've got a lot of uh, safety in the seats for your crew uh, in bad weather. What happens when you pick up your survivors? Uh, what sort of seats do they have? Straightforward to hard ones, I'm afraid. Um, remember, there's a big difference between collecting survivors for what will be relatively a short period to bring them ashore. Um, even if we're 100 miles out, they're not going to be out, they're not going to be long. Whereas the crews are exposed to it time after time after time after time. Um, so uh, they get a standard seat. And frankly, the weight loading of, as you notice, 10 survivors, 10 seats would be, would be too much. Um, uh, also, we've got a, you know, we do have a, um, I, I, I'll probably get Steve to correct me in a minute, or, or, or Peter, um, but there is a space premium on the boat, and we need to have, a, you know, we need space for stretchers and, and real and, and, and injured casualties as well as, as the walking wounded. Um, so they have to take their chance, I'm afraid, for a short ride. But, you know, to be honest with you, um, unless there's someone, if someone's in a life and death situation, um, I could give you another lecture about big sick, little sick first aid in the ROI, but that's another talk. Um, it, it, you know, we will hold them in a stable condition um, to get them to the nearest, um, ne the next line of first aid, which hopefully can be by a helicopter, but of course there are many cases where helicopters can't deploy, um, and we've got to get them ashore, and there'll be a judgment between speed, condition of casualty, so it can make the, the ride softer. But when getting there, it's 25 knots. Go. So. One simple, really, question. The Shannon project that wasn't good enough, what did you do with it? it, it, it it's being used for training, training pur purposes. Uh, and also, it does give us a platform to test out any development work we want to do on, on, on the kit. Uh, Steve, do you want to, Peter, do you want to add anything to what we're doing with the old one? With, with the first, first prototype? <laughs> Yeah, as Malcolm said, it's, it's been very useful to, to get our guys useful, uh, used to um, water jets. Um, one of the, the big issues with, with um, changing from a, a prop-driven boat to, to water jet-driven boats is to get the coxswains used to, to the completely different way of, 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 of driving it. Uh, so it's been useful for that reason. And also, it, it is because it's quite a hard ride, it's a really good way of testing whether your equipment will work in those sort of conditions. So it's been a good trials platform, but uh, it is um, based on a very successful pilot boat design. So once we finish doing the uh, doing the evaluation, we'll uh, we'll look to sell it to uh, to, to somebody else. Philomena of Alain, I'm a rest. I'm not a colleague, Malcolm. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> We're current colleagues. <laughs> current, but not from your previous incarnation. Um, the doctor, what does he or she do while everyone is trying to get the people on board? Or do you keep that person separate and just ready to deal with any casualties? I know the space is at a premium, which is why you probably don't have the luxury of having a warm body that's only there um, on spec. Um, yeah, yeah, the doctor's there to, to, um, to, to deal with the more severe ca casualties um, that, uh, that, that we may encounter. Uh, I think most doctors that go on board these lifeboats become pretty competent crew as well uh, and, and will help and assist. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, and the, 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 the very wide range of scenarios that these lifeboats encounter, you know, it, it, it's quite extreme. Um, there was one um, uh, not that long ago uh, where a, uh, a, a very young female doctor of very slight build suddenly found herself on a Tamar up in the, um, uh, you know, up in the north of Scotland there uh, with a Russian tanker. Uh, with three guys that had been swept down the deck and smashed into the breakwaters and, and pipework. Um, she was lifted off the lifeboat by a helicopter and dropped on the deck. Um, unfortunately, one was already dead. She managed to save the second one, and then the third one was badly injured. Um, and the, the helicopter pilot actually said he'd never seen a lifeboat flying before as it, as it, as it came off the wave tops. And she got a... Um, be careful. I think you've got a silver medal for that, if a gallantry. Um, so it, it, she, they're there to deal with the unexpected, the extreme. Sometimes we know what to expect because the Coast Guard will have sufficient information of the casualty to say, you must have the doctor, uh, and the doctor will be there. But having said that, the guys, on, the guys and the girls on, on, on the boats are extremely um, well-trained in, 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 in first aid. 
um, I refer to Big Sick, Little Sick, is a first aid course that we've developed ourselves because we didn't think the sort of traditional one was, was working. And that's now being taken up by, you know, the, the, the mountain rescue teams, um, uh, um, the Scottish Ambulance Service are now, now adopting it, and it's been accredited by the Royal College of Surgeons and, and so on. So we've got a very, uh, we've got a very effective success rate in getting a casualty alive, stable to the next point of you know, of contact. Thank you. Another colleague, uh, Jack, has <laughs> another uh, past user of Malcolm Services when he was with Three Keys. Uh, Malcolm, the water jets on these this new craft. Is, are they all um, joystick control, and, and what make are the uh, are the water jets? Uh, they're Hamiltons. Uh, they're not joysticks in the think probably the way you mean too, in terms of full uh, full rudder and and and, um, and, and jet con uh, control. They're simply the bucket and the engine speed control under two fi your fingertips, and a separate tiller control. But so, little tiny sticks. Yeah. So you really. Uh, with that configuration, you've been able to get rid of a lot of the sensors on the systems that Rolls-Royce use. Uh, yeah, I would have, yes, I guess so, uh, Jake. Yeah, we have, yeah. Um, I mentioned this guy from St. Ives who said the designer should be burnt. I, I, I watched this guy in a fairly heavy seaway off Paul, uh, off the sandbanks there, literally dance the, sh the Shannon round a, a seaway boil, touching it at different points of the boat simulating where you might go alongside to pull a casualty off. And he literally waltzed it round this boy with absolute precision control. It was, uh, frankly, it was, a, it was absolutely unbelievable. I mean, I, I, I can't sort of stress how amazing the, the manoeuvre ability is here. Thank you. Andy Owler, I'm uh, also ex-Merchant Navy and a, a lot RNLI fundraiser. Um, a common question is, why is the RNLI not government funded? Do you have a quick answer? It may not be one. <laughs> Um, first piece of, inf of information, uh, the uh, search and rescue service provided by the RNI is actually a commitment of the UK government under international convention. If we weren't there, they'd have to do it. It is a quirk of history, quirk of fate, w whatever, but um, um, in you know, 1824, when all the, all the little local town lifeboats came together to form a national service, it was a volunteer or organisation. And it has just grown with that volunteer ethos. If we put any government money into this organisation, I've got to be careful because there is a little dribble, but it's too technical to talk about in, in, a, in this form and too boring, I think, for you. Um, uh, it's, if, if we had government money, you'd absolutely destroy this volunteer e ethos. And it's the very bedrock of what the RLI is and does. Um, and, and I always like to stress, you know, that we always see the volunteer crews being put under those sort of stresses and strains and so on that you saw in the video. Um, but it's the army of fundraisers who have demonstrated a, a, a different form of courage who day in, day out, go out and get that 160 million, which is you know, an awful lot of money when you think about it. Uh, and and it, 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 it's their volunteering plus the operational crew volunteering that just makes you on an eye. And I think the, I mean, the, the executive, the, the, the staff, there's 1,350 staff at the back of these 44,000 people. Um, and any government money would absolutely destroy that, that volunteer e e e e ethos. Uh, it's an essential ingredient that says if the call comes, they will go, regardless. And uh, we as engineers and, and technologists worry a lot about safety cases and what's the limiting wave factors and all the rest of it. In fact, what we do is we put the most capable equipment and kit that we can, knowing that if when the call comes, if there's a life to be saved, they're going to go regardless. Um, so I hope that's a, a, a good enough answer. Yeah, really quite a humbling answer, actually, it, think, isn't it? it? I have to say, when it, it is humbling. When you see these lifeboat crews um, it, it, in operation, I talk about them in particular, but when you see a lifeboat crew, um, the, sort of the, the sorts of people they are, the characters they are, they're not all swashbuckling seamen. You, you get guys getting gold medals, you know, who, you, you know, you think you could knock over with a puff of wind at times. Um, they literally, you know, um, but they just have this inner strength, inner, inner warmth, inner calm, um, which I hope comes in part from the kit we give them. Yeah. We have, <laughs> 
Uh, David Short, I'm arrest. Uh, Malcolm, these water jets are very susceptible to sucking in debris, uh, plastic bags and stuff like this and in a casualty situation. I think that would be quite a risk. Have you taken any special precautions to prevent this? I'm going to ask Peter to answer that. Are you okay with that one, Peter? Hello, yeah. Um, we, we have, we've done extensive trials and we've pretty much sucked in everything under the sun, anything we can find in the sea. Uh, we've, we've run our test, test boat uh, on a beach uh, for 20 minutes, uh, running shingles through and uh, weed and kelp. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the impellers in the water jet get damaged uh, quite a lot when you take them out for inspection. But what it does, what it doesn't do is really uh, harm the performance of the boat, the ability for the boat to get to, uh, to, to save the people and get back uh, to safety. So the speed drops, but um, but in quite a predictable and controllable manner. And we don't have the issue that you'd have with a prop boat where you might um, severely damage one blade and cause uh, s uh, s severe um, vibrations. So um, they degrade gracefully, um, uh, uh, which, is, which is our experience in the conditions we're operating in. I must confess that answer frightens the life out of me as a repulsion hydrodynamicist. <laughs> I'll would, I would take one final one there, yes, thank you. Brunella Longo, an information consultant. You, you explain uh, you have this fantastic um, own, ownership of your own knowledge assets, uh, your own design, your own courses. I was wondering, is there any uh, structured way to manage all this? It's extremely structured. Uh, yes, it is. Um, um, I go back to this lean, which I know everyone's going to groan now within the Board of Trustees. Uh, lean is very much all about finding the value streams, what's called the value streams, in an organisation and how those value streams are, get delivered and how the people interact with those value streams, essentially to get rid of all the waste in delivering value. But that comes up with a discipline. Uh, um, I almost use the word control at that point, but it's, it's people understand fully their responsibility in the delivery, in the delivery chain. Um, we are concerned about the fact that we are a self-certifying body um, and we are working, uh, we have worked first of all with the, uh, the Marine and Coast Guard a Agency to develop a code of practice for um, small rescue craft. We're also, develop we're also uh, de developing and have drafted a large rescue craft, i.e. the all-weather lifeboat type thing. But we have now um, put that into what's called the International Marine Rescue Forum which is all the lifeboat services of all the world. Uh, you know, there's, every country's got something. Um, um, yeah, some are quasi-naval, some are pure volunteers and work on a part-time basis. But we, they're, they're developing the rescue boat code on an international basis. And we, that, um, that international code will then go to IMO, which will then be acknowledged by IMO. Obviously, the, the length is too small for IMO to ratify it as a, yeah, as a, yeah, 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 any form of design code, but they will acknowledge it, um, uh, and it will then be accepted on an international basis, and then we can then demonstrate that we design to that, to that, to those sets of codes. Um, um, I mean, I've got to say, we did draft the first version, and, but we're allowing the international community to to shape it and take it forward to get over this problem of self serve not problem. I don't think we've got a problem, but we have to be very conscious of it. And in fact, I've just tasked the team um, uh, at our next formal technical meeting that we'll do a full design governance review so we can run through the process and therefore put audit it. Therefore, we as the trustees will audit that process and say, right, we're, we are content with it. Uh, I must confess, I don't lose any sleep over it at all. I have other worries in the RNI uh, not associated with the design and build of boats. But I better, better clarify that. I have more worry about how we actually build them in the future. Uh, I've already said we've got our own hull moulding cap capability, which will do all our hulls. Um, and we've just, literally in the last couple of months, we've um, agreed and authorised the capital expenditure to establish our full boat building capability in port. So we will do the whole job ourselves. Um, and the reason is, as I said, uh, under, under lean, we know we can reduce the manufacturing hours. And when, when those, one of those Tamars costs £3 million a shot, and we know we can get the cost of those down, and we will get the cost of those down by doing it ourselves. So in a couple of years' time, we perhaps have a technical visit to the boatyard at Port. Sounds something. We, we, I think we'll hold you to that, as it were. I, th I think, Malcolm, you, you've 
discussed a subject. I've been watching the faces here with absolute interest in every, in every sort of word that you've, uh, you've uttered there. It's a service that whether we serve at sea or we have occasion to play at sea or we just on land, that I think everybody is thankful for the work that you and all of your colleagues there do in preserving that service. And thank you for just lifting the, the curtain on, on that whole area there. So I wonder, ladies and gentlemen, and Malcolm, after this, has got one more slide that he wants to show you. So I'm not certain whether I should distribute those seasick pills again. Yeah, but, but nevertheless, can we thank Malcolm in our normal way? This is not about lifeboats. I wanted to just let everyone know uh, about the UK national flagship yeah, project. Anyone that reads the Daily Mail will have seen this already, but I just wanted to say this is a, a, a project to build what you see, a very large square rig sailing ship, very high tech, um, to provide a, a combination of sail training, marine science platform, and education in a general sense, obviously with a marine bias. And lo, lo and behold, um, you've guessed it, in the half quarters there will be um, accommodation, accommodation for the head of state. It will also have conferencing and exhibition spaces arranged in it. Uh, the project's been around for some time but has now received political endorsement for, from the leaders of all three parties, um, obviously without any government money, let's be absolutely clear, uh, but we have now received um, seed corn funding of £5 million from Lord Ashcroft. So the project is starting to move. Um, and we will shortly be commissioning, I will shortly be commissioning some preliminary studies to get this project underway. We very much, uh, I very much envisage seeing this being um, uh, engaging both the Nautical Institute, RENA and IMRS uh, on the technical development of, of this vessel, um, which will obviously be a, a, a huge technical challenge, uh, a ship of this size, 200 metres. Um, and also quite a challenge for UK shipbuilding ca ca capability. So all I would like to say is, watch this space. <laughs> Thank you very much.